Not as many as in October. Hot take, I know. Song of Ice and Fire is great. This is not for me. I was excited for it, but I was just like the April device is better. So I read a lot of books in November. Not as many as in October, but you know, a respectable amount. <laughs> I also read the shortest books first, so since I stack my books as I read them, it, the bottom of this stack is some very tiny books. It has been, um, it is not <laughs> structurally sound, my leading tower of books, so I have been living in fear of it toppling all month, so I'm delighted to be finally filming my wrap up so that that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, so we're gonna do in reverse order, just like I did for October, because I don't feel like reversing the stack. I just scratched myself. So yeah, we're gonna go from the latest, the last book that I read to the first book that I read. Let's do this before they fall. <sighs> the last book that I read, technically I finished it on December 1st, but I did read like probably half of it in November. And that was <laughs> half the world actually. This is terrible to do it in reverse order because I did also read Half a King. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. <laughs> After Half the World is the second book in the Shattered Sea trilogy. Uh, as I mentioned in my TBR at some point, whatever, I have mentioned that having now run out of first law books, it occurred to me that I could actually in 2021 read all the books Abercrombie has written if I squeeze in the Shattered Sea. So we're squeezing in the Shattered Sea. And I am I have not been especially impressed with the Shattered Sea. I reread Half a King because I actually read that a few years ago. And there was the Patron Buddy read, which we'll get to that one. And I think I liked Half the World better. It definitely started out with me thinking that I liked it better, but as it went on, it didn't hold my interest any better than Half a King did. And partly it is the audiobook narrator. So even though I have a crap load of books on my December TBR, I'm gonna try, do my best to read physically uh, Have a War, that's the third one, to see if that changes anything because there are so many times when I've been like, listening to the narrator and then like instead of continuing to listen to the story I just think to myself wow he just read that line like it was just a line but that was in fact like <laughs> really dry sarcasm and he didn't read it like that so I just I feel like I don't think the Shattered Sea could ever compete with First Law no matter who was reading it but if you know Stephen Pacey was reading this there are a lot of moments of dry wit that the narrator just reads straight and so he's not a bad narrator in the sense of like sounding bad or stupid or ridiculous or having a bad voice he just reads everything very straight and so much of it is sarcasm and so i feel like that is a lot of the charm of it because the story itself it's a it's a pretty good story it brought some pretty good twists and turns got some good action it's an abercrombie book but a lot of i think the charm of it what it does have is mess missing when the audiobook narrator just doesn't bother to read humor in a humorous way. So yeah, I will try to read Half a War. I said that about Half the World and then I just ran out of time and I was like, ah, I gotta finish it. So I will try at least for some part of it for Half a War to read it physically and see if that changes anything. I think it won't hurt it anyway. <laughs> so yeah, I, I also gave this three stars. Originally I thought when I started it, because I gave Half a King three stars both time that I read it. First time I read it and now again when I reread it, I was like, yes, yeah, still three stars. And Half, a, Half the World when I started, I was like, oh, this might be like, uh, 3.5 verging on a four, but by the end I was like, no, no, it's a three, which might be the narrator's fault. But yeah, they're not bad, but they're, they're not, they very much pale in comparison to the first law. And yeah, like they're, they're fine. You don't know what they are at all. They are Abercrombie's sort of like Viking inspired YA series. And it's quite mature for YA, but it is definitely, you know, less mature because it is YA than first law. And it's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Next up I have A Clash of Kings by George R. R. Martin. As you are well aware, I should think, I am one of the co-hosts of the Song of Ice and Fire read-along and uh, in November we read Clash of Kings and our chat this time wasn't three hours, it was only like two and a half. So, you know, we had so much less to say about Clash of Kings. I mean, we talked about it for two and a half hours. So if you want to hear what we all we had to say about Clash of Kings, that's available to you. Um, but suffice to say, we're all just kind of like gobsmacked by just how dang good these books are. Because it's it's one of those things you kind of like, I don't know if take for granted is the right word, but it's just sort of such a, such a fact, you know, that like these books exist, everyone knows what they are, you know, there was a show made of them, that it, it feels, I don't know, trite to mention them. It feels like an obvious opinion to think they're good. So to the point where it's like, it's past the point 
of you acknowledging they're good and it almost doesn't feel like they're good anymore. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense. I feel like, you know what I mean? And like to pick the books up and actually like read them again and sort of like reacquaint yourself with the actual text. And and we're all three of us and I think everyone who's participating is, is sitting there going, you know what? There's a reason these books were the sensation they were, the game changer for the genre they were, that they got an HBO adaptation because they, you know what? They're freaking good. <laughs> They're freaking good. George R. R. Martin is a good writer. So yeah, we've just been, we've just been wowed on this reread going, you know what? You know what? These are great. <laughs> Hot take, I know. Song of Ice and Fire is great. Next up I have The Dragon Republic by R.F. Kuang. Barely got this in under the wire. Uh, this is the second book in the Poppy War series and one of my goals for the year was to finish this series so like I'm trying to make that happen. Gotta read Burning God next month or this month. And I... I mean I gave it the same rating. I gave Poppy War four stars and I also gave this four stars. And in terms of how it compares to Poppy War, I think I liked Poppy War a little bit better. Hard to say. There is a more overt sense of structure and shape to the story in the Poppy War. You have um, a, the... That's really the only way I can say it. There is a form to the story that you can recognize. Here, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen, but that's kind of what it feels like. There's things happening and there's no recognizable kind of arc to it. No recognizable trajectory for it. Uh, and so I guess, I mean, this is one of the, I, I very often like middle books best in trilogies, but this is one of the situations where like, I get why middle book syndrome is a thing. Because this book feels like what people complain about with middle books, which I rarely feel. That we're not really starting anything. We're not really finishing anything. There is no shape to this. There is, it's just the middle bits, just stuff happening to get us from the beginning that was the first book and then what presumably will be the epic conclusion in the third book. This book, again, tons of stuff happens. Lots of stuff happens. Reveals happen, character development happens, but this, it doesn't have this propulsive shape to it. And then what I also came to sort of came to the conclusion about the series, like why I just don't connect with it as much as I do other books or stories, it's not actually to do with how dark it is, because it is really effing dark. But it's just the characters, I don't think characterization is our long strong point. And that's why I don't mean to say they're bad, because I've read books where characterization is actively bad. The characterization is adequate. But the characters are kind of one note, is the best way I can put it. And so there's sort of a lack of variety and nuance to the characters. And again, they, it's not like they feel like cardboard cutouts, they don't feel like caricatures, they don't feel like plot devices, but they don't feel like there's a, a lot to them. They're pretty one note. And so it's just very bleak and very dark and they're all kind of like... Yeah. So like, I feel like I'm being... I feel like it's not very harsh. I still give it four stars. I still think it's a remarkable book. But it's hard for me to feel passionately about it for these reasons. And that disappoints me, but I'm looking forward to reading Burning God and I would absolutely recommend this series if all of the darkness of it does not um, concern or put you off. <laughs> Next up I have The Ember Blade by Chris Wooding. This was the book that my patrons chose for me to read and vlog for them, so I did. And this was not a win for me. No, actually like I forgot I read them back to back, but like when I was complaining about the characterization in Dragon Republic and in that series in general, and then I said there are books where characterization is like kind of actively bad, I was kind of thinking of Ember Blade. Because Ember Blade, I think, is just a lot of potential that is squandered. So I, I at its core, I like kind of the type of story it's trying to tell, the type of characters that it's attempting to portray, but I think it's done badly. I think the prose isn't very good. I think the world building isn't very good. I think it's delivered in an extremely info dumpy expository way that feels unnatural and makes it feel fake for that reason. Makes the characters feel fake for that reason. And everything is just so over explained all the time. And I all, I tend to prefer things to be under explained, if anything. So this is not for me. I can see why it's so popular. Like, honestly, I feel like like if you love The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn, people, it says on here, you know, if you like Brandon Sanderson, you're going to like this. I mean, I think so. Those are a lot of the similar complaints that I had about those books. And those books are extremely popular. People love Faithful and the Fallen. People love Brandon Sanderson. So clearly people are not having these issues. So I, th I think like it's not that surprising to me that this book is as popular as it is or, or 
became so highly recommended because I feel like the people who are recommending it are the same people that would recommend The Faithful and the Fallen and The Cosmere. And that's just obviously like, we have, we have learned together that that is not me. I am not a fan of this. So it's, it's not the worst thing I've read. I liked it better than Malice. I did. So like if people are like really like Malice and they think this is even better, I mean, I would agree. I just think that Malice is not good and this is okay. So if you are a fan of those other books, and those other authors, and you've heard great things about this, you'll probably like. But if you're like me and a picker of knits and, and feel about world building and prose and characterization the way that I do, I doubt you will like this very much. <laughs> Next up I have Wondersmith by uh, The Calling of Morrigan Crow, the second book in the Nevermore series by Jessica Townsend. I've already read this with Fish from Books with Fee. We are loving it. As I already said in my TBR video, we are like, super stoked to read Hollow Pox in December. This is just an absolutely charming, wonderful, whimsical, middle grade series. And I, I love the main character Morgan Crow because she is so sassy and snarky. And the world itself is full of wonder and whimsy. The magic in it is quite cool. And I do think that this is a much better replacement for Harry Potter than, um, well, I mean, it says a poignant, a Harry Potter-esque adventure. I mean, and it is because it's, you know, it's got that kind of portal fantasy element to it. It has something of a chosen one element to it, the way that Harry Potter does. The main character, unlike in the films, Harry Potter in the books is quite snarky and sassy and kind of dry-witted. So is Morrigan. And the the world itself is, you know, it's just kind of strange and and fun and cool, but you know, in that slightly dangerous way. And the sort of mysteries for the larger plot and the big band that this sets up and the the questions this one begins to ask. Um, the first one really kind of sets things up. This one sort of begins to delve a bit in sort of the implications of some of these magics and these identities and and what it means to hold these powers etc etc so i just i thought it was very excellent and i loved it more than the first one i'm super stoked to read hollow box next up i have a declaration of the rights of magicians by hg perry i loved this like i hoped that i would and that's so it really happens for me 99 percent of the time and i'm stoked about a book i'm like well I was excited for it, but it was shit. I, I guess maybe because I did go into this sort of being like, oh, I hope it's good, but it probably won't be. Maybe that helped it. This was everything that I hoped it would be. And I, I also definitely see why it's not got a very high rating, uh, sort of broadly speaking, and why Bethany didn't like it. That's why she sent it to me. She was like, yeah, you're gonna have it. Uh, and it's, it's not for everyone, but it is definitely for me. And I think if you're a reader like me. So... What do I mean by that? So if you, I talked about what this was about in my TBR, but for a refresher, this is the Enlightenment sort of era, and it is a historical fiction fantasy or a fantasy retelling alternate history fantasy. Um, so it, we follow like actual historical figures like um, Robespierre and William Pitt and Toussaint Louverture, and they are in a world in which there is magic, and they individually may or may not be magic users themselves. So we are sort of following the events of the Enlightenment, of um, abolitionist uprise or abolition abolitionist movements, the French Revolution, and following like those historical events, but they are being shaped and altered and or explained by magic. So it was quite reminiscent to me of like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which does is more focused on Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell and less on history, but it does play with like retelling the Napoleonic War era with magic. Uh, so this is like if the project of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell was more focused on actually like retelling the Napoleonic War with magic. So I, I thought it was excellently well done. It is quite um, a lot of years pass in this book. So like it took some getting used to how quickly we were zipping through history because uh, there's a lot of events to cover and it kind of wants to introduce us to these characters and to where they're set up. Uh, you know, how they're, what kind of powers they have, what they have access to, who they are. And then we just, we have these like time jumps where suddenly, you know, three years have passed, you know, two years have passed, a year has passed. So that was, that was a bit jarring at first, but then I got used to it. And for that reason, it kind of did remind me of reading a history book or a nonfiction about history, because that's kind of what nonfiction about history does. It kind of is like, there's this important event in this historical figure's life. And then we move on to the next important event, which might be three years later. And of course we zip around also like geographically, like we're 
we've got our folks in England, we've got our folks in France, we've got our folks in, in the colonies. So it's, it's doing a lot with a lot. And if you don't like people messing with history and adding magic to history, probably won't like it. If you don't actually like more historical fiction type of narratives where it's a little more dry, uh, you probably won't like it. But if you do think that it's fun to pat add a magical twist to historical events and how that can like maybe serve to explain something or then how that should be altered to fit now with magic or how that can be reimagined to include magic. Uh, if that sounds good to you, I think you will really like this. I think it is excellently well crafted and researched and executed. And I did actually like, even though it's a little more arm's length and kind of that historical fiction feel of like telling you about characters over large periods of time, I did feel connected to the characters more so than I have in a lot of just straight up fiction books. And I just thought it was very, very clever, very clever. And I'm super stoked to read the second book, which is A Radical Act of Free Magic, because I also have some ideas about where this is probably going to go and how magic is going to be affecting the part of history that we are now entering in that book. So I'm super pumped for it. But like, I guess I would say I recommend it if that all sounds good to you. But like, I wouldn't just say like, it's great, everyone should read it. Like, I get why it doesn't appeal to everybody. I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> Next up is a book that I, uh, for now, have DNF'd. And that is Eye of the World by Robert Jordan. I made it to... Oh, I took my bookmark out. I made it to chapter 10. <laughs> So that far. I did request the audiobook from the library. Of course, there's like a 10 million year hold on it or 10 million year wait on it because of the show. So whenever that comes in, I'll finish the book that way so I can just say I've done it so that I know this first installment at least. But I I, I DNF'd it unlike a lot. Of, I, mean, I, I very rarely DNF. <laughs> People even... Friends of mine are like, you should DNF more. And I have reasons for not doing that. But this was a situation where like, I don't think I'm gonna change my mind. I don't think this, like I've seen enough and I, I'm not gonna like this. This is not for me. Uh, and I, I don't see that changing or improving or something happening to, to compensate for its failings. Like I, I just, I don't, this is, I'm not gonna like this. It's not gonna happen. And I don't think I also have that much to say about it. Like it's not a situation where like I need to finish this because like there's just so much to unpack for why I don't like it. I just, the reasons for why I don't like it are pretty straightforward. Those being that I think the pros is bad and I think the world building is like nothing to write home about characterization is is nigh on non-existent so that's I don't have a lot to say about that other than like nope <laughs> next up I have Magnus Chase and the Sword of Summer which is the first book in the Magnus Chase books by Rick Riordan this was the Blades and Bodice Rippers pick for the month so the live uh discussion on this book was on Mara's channel as it was her pick if you want to see the replay of that that is available to you I didn't love this I didn't hate it, but uh, again, if you if you saw our live, if you're gonna see our live, basically, I just I was like, the jokes are pretty good, but this book is entirely composed of jokes, and I find that exhausting, frankly. Uh, I also found like the aging a little weird. Like uh, the, uh, the main character is 16, and he certainly does not sound or behave like a 16 year old, which I give a lot. I tend to give more leeway when it's the other way around, where younger kids act older, because you know I can, uh, you know that. That is more forgivable to me because people can mature at a young age, um, or at least that's something that is a positive change. But like, he acts like a 12 year old and he's 16 and I'm like, well. So I just, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just felt kind of meh about it. Um, I definitely would say that I like the Nevermore books better in terms of a magical, whimsical, middle grade story. So I just, I just don't think this is for me. Next up I read The Box in the Woods by Maureen Johnson. This is another truly devious novel. It is set in the same world as truly devious even though it's not like a magical fantasy world. But so the truly devious trilogy is complete. That mystery is wrapped up. But so the main character from truly devious is now solving a different mystery and this is a standalone book. And <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. I think if you like the Truly Devious books, you will like this. But funnily enough, while the Truly Devious trilogy felt a little bit like this mystery is being dragged over three books. Like, I mean, I still really enjoyed Truly Devious. It wasn't a huge problem for me, but there's a little bit of a sense of like, we're still not solving this mystery, like to like stretch it out so that you don't get the resolution of that mystery until the third book. And then this book is a standalone. So I felt the, I mean, I guess maybe I just got used to the this slower pacing, the dragging of the Truly Devious books where this one, I was just like, oh my God, we're already getting the answer to the mystery. It's too fast. 
So I think the answer is it needs to be duologies. Truly Devious was a trilogy and that was slightly too much. This was too short. <laughs> duologies. If she writes more, I want it to be a duology. But anyway, if you like the Truly Devious books, I think you'll like this. It's a pretty good mystery. It's still got the like quirk and humor of the characters from Truly Devious. So if you liked the characters, they're in it again. The mystery is decently interesting and atmospheric and um, it was a good time. Next up I have Tar and Wanderer. This is the fourth book in the Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. This is the penultimate book and I really enjoy this. I mean I've been enjoying all the Prydain books as I've said so many times. I feel like I'm a broken record. This book does get a little bit more serious. It's a little more mature than the other books have been. It's not just like a whimsical fun adventure. I mean it is a whimsical fun adventure but it's less of that and more of a story of sort of finding self, finding meaning. Um, it's got that kind of hero's journey, hero's quest element to it. And it has, it definitely, it's just so like, I was reading this and Magnus Chase around the same time. And I was just thinking to myself, cause I mean, this is written for, Prydain books are written for kids as well. They're obviously older and they not, you know, a contemporary setting. Like everything about the Prydain books is obviously more archaic, but I was just thinking to myself, how much better these books are at balancing like fun, whimsy, and magic and, and humor. They actually have a lot of humor in these books with still more poignant moments and darker themes and the story about maturing and, and beginning to take responsibility and finding your place in the world and finding out who you are and what your priorities are. And it has a very sort of like fairy tale structure, like especially this one in terms of like, it, it felt extremely like a fairy tale insofar as it's sort of like a, a series of trials, a series of teaching moments kind of that it just, if you've read a lot of kind of like folklore and fable and fairy tale and folk story, it, it feels very much in keeping with that style. Kind of like when you read the Winter Night Trilogy by Catherine Arden, like it evokes that vibe. And like, you know that, you know, these moments, they aren't meant to be read so literally because that's unrealistic that like you go from place to place to place where you learn a thing. But it feels like it's just sort of an, a nod to that type of storytelling very intentionally. And I just thought it was really, really beautiful. And I'm really excited to read the final book in December. Next up I have The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. And I liked this even less than The Night Circus. I'm real sad because this book is real pretty so pretty honestly like 10 out of 10 cover design um but i feel like the book the cover of it is very indicative of the book itself because the book is also all show and no substance i felt that way about the night circus but the night circus did at its core have a, a story with an arc and you know, kind of the shape of things like that the starless sea it's it's <laughs> it's literally just the author like wanting to design vibes and just was like I will weave that together somehow. I mean honestly reading the Night Circus and the Starless Sea I'm just like you know what Erin Morgenstern I don't think being an author is your calling. I think being a party planner, an event planner, a wedding planner that might be your calling because when you're describing the various places, the various events, the various parties that occur the circus that occurs in the Night Circus but in here as well you know there's an epic kind of more literary event and it sounds fabulous. <laughs> it sounds like a wonderful description on Yelp. Cool vibey places does not a story make. Especially when like those cool vibey things aren't actually serving any greater purpose of significance, meaning, symbolism, or whatever. And before you at me, like I've, I'm aware that there are people that think that there is deeper meaning to be had here. And I frankly just disagree. <laughs> I think if you're finding deeper meaning in here, I'm really happy for you, but I think you are, you know, putting that on it. I don't think Erin Morgan's turn is responsible for any deeper meaning. It, if there is meaning to be found, it is incidental or accidental. Um, sorry. <laughs> Next up I have Skyward by Brandon Sanderson, which I gave five stars to. I mean, technically I gave it four and a half, which I, whenever I give a half star, I, I almost without the exception round up. I really loved this and I flew through it. It was so fast to read. And I really think that, because I complain frequently about Brandon Sanderson's writing style being plain, being very telly, the dialogue being very plain and modern, particularly in high fantasy. I'm, I can't with the kind of dialogue that sounds like it could be between like two college roommates, 
but you know you're in armor and holding swords and talking about your nation I'm like I just I cannot with that but a YA book that is a space adventure where a teenage girl has like classmates that she quips with I mean that is where that style is on point that's what it's called for here being slightly simpler and how you explain things and presenting it very clearly to the reader it's a ya space adventure that's where we want that so like i just feel like brandon sanderson's writing style even the things that i generally regard negatively just work so much better in this context like here here it's fine here it's great here it's what you want so i thought this was compulsively readable a great time i almost docked an entire star for scud and scudding being the in universe cursing but whatever um yeah i just yeah i really really enjoyed my time with this and i'm excited to read star sight and cytonic which i fully intend to do very soon next up i have lady midnight by cassandra clare i've been meaning to read the dark artifices for forever ever and i kept hearing people say the dark artifices was like her best work to date and i kept thinking like i mean i guess i believe you i just find that hard to believe but because I, I love the Infernal Devices and I haven't really liked anything else that I've read by Cassandra Clare since. Only the Infernal Devices. So I was excited to find another Infernal Devices. But I just, I, this is way too long. And a lot of it is like, I mean, a lot of the Infernal Devices is mopey drama, but it's, it's shorter. <laughs> and I also do think the characters are better. This was, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm just too old for this. Maybe if I reread the Infernal Devices now, maybe I wouldn't like it. I don't know. That, that scares me a lot because I have fond memories of reading it. This was too long and too mopey and too much of just like things that could be resolved. People would just talk to each other for so long. And like the magic side of things, the like actual events of the book, the plot isn't a very good plot. It's clear that we're here for the relationship drama, which in the Infernal Devices is also true. I just think the relationship drama is better <laughs> and it is something that I'm more invested in and I think is, I don't know. I just like the Infernal Devices better. Maybe it's people in suits and corsets having relationship drama that is just like, yes. People in the modern day, I'm like, get a life. <laughs> uh, I don't think it was bad. I definitely liked it better than um, The Mortal Instruments, what I read of that. That I just could not with. But so like as comp comparing it to The Mortal Instruments, I'm like, yeah, this is a step up from that, no doubt. And there's a lot of good representation and inclusion and, and diversity, etc. that I appreciated, but not from like, a, I'm having friend reading this standpoint. I just like observed it going on and I was like, good on you for having that in there. But I didn't like, that does not make it a good story. That doesn't make it, you know, I'm just like, I'm like, I'm glad you're doing that, but I'm, <laughs> you know, it doesn't improve the reading experience. So I don't know if I'll, I mean, I wanted, I in theory wanted to read this before reading the new series, which is again, historical fiction, like The Emperor Devices, I might just give this, I'll just look up the Wikipedia summaries because if there's any chance of me liking another Cassandra Clare book, I think it's gonna be when we hit back to the old timey times because that works way better for me. <laughs> Next up I have Half a King by Joe Abercrombie, which I already talked about because it's the first book in the Shattered Sea. I think it's of the two, I think it is the weaker of the two. Uh, you cannot skip it. <laughs> and again, I do think that I probably would like it better if I physically read it myself and wasn't getting it from the the dry boring humorless narrator because there is a lot of dry wit um there is actually a brief nod to first law in here which is insignificant it doesn't actually mean anything it's not like he's joe abercrombie's building a cosmere but it's fun if you read the first law to be like ha -ha. that's like the highlight of the whole book though yeah it's very meh i kind of already explained that when i talked about half a world so um it's okay Next up I have Redwall by Brian Jakes. I said Jakewees in my TBR video because I was pretty sure I remembered and much from my childhood watching the cartoon they did the the like Saturday morning show they did based on Redwall and Brian himself often appeared um, like after the show or before the show or whatever to talk about it. And I remembered him pronouncing it for what I thought was a weird way to pronounce it at the time. And then I now thought I remembered him saying Jakewees, but apparently he says it Jakes. Whatever. Redwall, <laughs> which I hadn't read since I was probably in middle school, elementary school, middle school. I don't know how old I was. It all blurs together. I read a bunch of these books when I was at the age that they are meant for. And it was honestly, it was just so nostalgic. It is such a cozy, perfect book for fall, especially because the the setting of Redwall Abbey itself and all of like the gathering of the harvest and the foods they're making and this like cozy collective living where this little community and the facing the like darkness and it's just so sweet and nostalgic and cute and 
nice and I love Redwall and I think I'm gonna read some more of these Redwall books um reread these Redwall books because you know it's just like a hug it's just real cozy and last which was in fact first <laughs> are The Merchant of Venice and Shylock is My Name which were the Hogarth uh Shakespeare retelling of and the Shakespeare play that it is a retelling of that me and Heather chatted about uh, we had a great discussion. If you missed the live, the replay is available if you are interested in seeing it. Um, this is probably my favorite of the Hogarths that we have read. There are only two that I have not read. And I talked about this early on and, and was already telling Heather that I thought it'd be my favorite, but the style of the retelling, it there's something Abercrombie-esque about the style of the writing itself, which like, I don't need to explain why it's my favorite, but it does almost have this feel of like, if, if, Joe Abercrombie decided to do a modern retelling of The Merchant of Venice, it would feel like this. So if that appeals to you, I would actually recommend this. I don't recommend reading it if you have not read or seen Merchant of Venice because it does not stand on its own. If you have not read Merchant of Venice, you will not understand this book just like flat out. But I very, very much enjoyed this. And those are all the books that I read in November. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but on Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you.